It all started months ago. One late night intrusive thought that I actually got while reading some of your comments on my first Roller Coaster Tycoon video from nearly three years ago now. In the background, that morbid yet nostalgic scene of the roller coaster exploding and the guest drowning played. And perhaps it was that familiar sense of morbidity that we all seem to get anytime game devs make us players gods. Perhaps it's because I've always personally been a fan of mundane and uncanny horror. Perhaps it was because around the same time, my old roommate rediscovered these two, who you might remember from my solitaire video. Whatever the reason, that night, a very clear vision slid into my subconscious as I rewatched that Roller Coaster Tycoon intro. Wouldn't it be creepy, unnerving, if the NPCs in the game also reacted when we did something horrific like this? And what if, instead of terror, like you typically get when raising havoc in something like a Rockstar game, what if the NPCs stopped, looked right at you, and celebrated? Celebrated your sick, twisted sense of humor too. And this idea was so stupid and silly, but it stayed with me because I wondered if it was actually possible to accomplish with some manipulation. It stayed with me enough that I started spending my nights reversing the game again to learn more about its graphic systems and writing code to manipulate the graphics and the gameplay to try to achieve this vision. But the more I dove in, the more I discovered, the more complicated I realized this was going to be to achieve. Weeks of late night reversing and research and tinkering went by. And at many points, I really wanted to give up so badly. But something kept bringing me back, back and back again, until finally. My original vision come to life. Today, I'm ready to share everything I learned in this journey, mod code included, and show you exactly how I twisted Roller Coaster Tycoon, our beloved childhood game, into a Jordan Peele-esque horror scene. If you're ready, sit back and let's dive in. After all, our guests are waiting. I'm Jeff of All Trades. Let's see if we can't master this horrifying one. As always, before we get started, I like to include some important notes about what you need to know and what's nice to know in order to get the most out of this tutorial. As far as the need to know column, basic programming constructs and principles in any programming language really, stuff like loops, if statements, functions, and variables, etc. Hexadecimal, decimal, and binary number systems are definitely going to be useful. And even the tiniest bit of some reversing, debugging, or disassembly experience as we're gonna be moving a lot quicker than some of my more intro level uh, videos here. And if you struggle with this, or if this is your first time delving into reverse engineering, do know that I have a free master of none is what I call it, beginner's course on my channel, all about x86 disassembling and debugging and reversing. What's gonna be nice to know is x86 assembly, of course. Again, check out the tutorial if you have never dealt with it before. And if you know some basic principles of 2D computer graphics, which I had a very light knowledge of before going into this, I learned a lot more making this video, that's gonna help you out a lot too. As always, check my pinned comment below. If there's any updates or corrections, I will list them there. Please leave me some feedback and any questions you have here on YouTube or on Mastodon or on Reddit or on GitHub, wherever you feel most comfortable. And lastly, as always, please like and subscribe if you enjoy. Share it with any others who you may think may be interested in this material and comment anything you'd like to see in my future videos. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy. Welcome everybody. Oh, it's so good to be here and finally be recording this. Uh, as I said in the intro, it's been 
months of work, mostly because I'm, I was limited in the time I had to dedicate to a lot of the reversing. I probably could have gotten it done a lot quicker if I had more time, but life gets in the way as usual. If you're new here, uh, this channel is all about, um, right now it's all about reversing and we've done some malware stuff and we've done some uh, general game modding and hacking stuff with RCT actually, that was the first video I uploaded. And if you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, I gotta say this now because if I don't at the beginning of the video, I know you've already sat through a lot, but if I don't say it now, then people will not hear it. But to everybody who's sent um, all the words of encouragement, this video would not have happened without you. Um, throughout this time, as I alluded to in the intro, I wanted to give up on this. Uh, I had already broken my golden rule of talking about a video before it's done. And, um, there were times that I really thought about giving up on this one after I started it. It was just, I kept hitting walls and then I kept getting messages from uh, a lot of you who saw my other videos. And when I talked about, you know, I, I kind of alluded to some people that I was working on this and, um, you were so encouraging and, uh, it, it really kept me going. And the other thing is that I just looked and the channel's nearly at 9,000 subs. And I'm sorry, I know I'm gushing about this, but I, I've said this before in my older videos. I used to have a, an old channel that I used to grind about and I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't ever do that again. And that old channel, which I thought was successful, um, had less subs than that. And it's amazing to be able to make these videos and not have to worry about grinding it out or, or being on a strict timeline. And it's because of you guys who, who let me know that, Hey man, it's okay. If you take some time, we're just excited that you're coming up with something. We're excited to see what you got. And, uh, that really got me through the end of this. So I just wanted to say a quick thank you to all of you. Um, especially those who've been around and have, you know, eagerly anticipated all the, all the teasers of this video. So with all that out of the way, let's dive into this thing. I'm really excited to share all the crazy, uh, fever dream, things that happened uh, leading up to this idea. The idea itself was a fever dream and, and everything after it feels like <laughs> just wild, all the things I've gone through. I've got so many things open here, I'm sorry. Um, they're all gonna come in handy at some point in this video though, so that's why I have so many things open. First thing, we're gonna pop open here, and as always, I leave uh, links to download all these tools. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know that um, we've used a lot of these um, almost in, in nearly every video. So today for the reversing and disassembly, I've got Ghidra. Um, I don't think I'm running the latest and greatest anymore. This was updated um, probably a couple months ago now. So I don't know if I had the latest build, but it shouldn't be too terribly different. And of course, I've got X64 debug, or in this case, the X32 debug version of that. If you download X64, uh, if you download X64 debug, you automatically get the X32 debug. And since Roller Coaster Tycoon is a 32-bit executable, we'll be using that version. And <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, I think I've kept all my settings at the same zoom level. So hopefully we'll, we'll see what happens when we bring it up. But hopefully everything is good enough looking that you can uh, see it and it's zoomed in enough that you can uh, take a good look at it on the view that you have. I know for mobile users, this gets really tricky. Um, I always get some comments that like, hey, you need to blow up your screen. And it's, it's always a balancing act. So I'm sorry, I can't blow it up massively because then we it gets really hard to navigate. So I apologize in advance, um, but I do appreciate the feedback as always. All right, so I am going to load up. I'll bring it over here. I've got two monitors here with all my other stuff on it. I have rct.exe uh, copied over. It's usually in your program files when you install the game. I've got it copied over to my working folder here and download. So I'm gonna bring that into Ghidra and add it to my project here. Go ahead and open it up and have Ghidra do all the initial analysis here. Now, just like the first video, and this is important, I realized in retrospect because I didn't talk about it in my first video, I am still using a actual physical CD-ROM of the gold edition of Roller Coaster Tycoon. Uh, I found it just like I talked about in my first video. I found it in my basement at some point unpacking when we had just moved into our house during uh, COVID right before I made that video. So since then, I've gotten so many comments about like, hey man, like I'm running RCT from a completely different source or I downloaded it or you're running open RCT. First of all, open RCT, which I love that project, different project, uh, does not function in the same way as the original Roller Coaster Tycoon did. Same thing goes for, I know some people have downloaded RCT from 
uh, some of the like archive game websites, that's great. You may run into issues where something I see or talk about here is not the same as what you see in your game. And that's because some of those games are uh, packed with a packer technology. I know I've seen some comments about that. Um, some of them might be written slightly differently, especially since this is the gold edition. It's got all these expansions. And so you're executable if you're, run, if you're following along or playing at home with RCT. Your executable might look a little bit different. And the code I'll give you should work with most executable versions. But I want to say that because I get so many comments about, you know, hey, this doesn't match my game. The point of my first video and this video was never really to like walk you through step by step exactly what the change in the game. It's more about practicing those skills of reversing so that you can take, you know, your slightly different version and you can, you know, make these fixes yourself. You know what to look for. Um, even if my code doesn't work exactly like it does with this gold edition and your edition, hopefully these videos are helping you. Uh, mod not only you know different versions of RCT but other games as well. So just wanted to get that out of the way. And I have seen uh, some of you have sent me your blog posts and other like website write ups about uh, other games you've um, modded using my first video. And I I love seeing that stuff. Please continue to send that. I always try to spread that on my social media um, when other people do that. I love to see people putting this stuff into practice. It's it's always really fun. All right, so we let Gidra get through the analysis. Let me put this into full screen here. And uh, I think that looks pretty good as far as readability. Um, I will very quickly maybe try to get the middle window slightly larger. Let me see if I can do that real quick while this is analyzing. All right, I think 14 is pretty good. Um, Again, I'll try to highlight with my mouse as always uh, what we're looking at. It's always hard. Like I said, it's a balancing act to get readability there and also uh, make sure that you can actually navigate and we're not stuck on like two instructions in the window. So in this video, I, I usually start these videos by kind of walking through as if we're, we're approaching this fresh uh, side by side together. I'm going to be doing this video a little bit differently. Um, it's going to be more of like a retrospective of all the things that I went through personally to um, in my approach to figure out how to mod this game and, and get that end result I showed in the intro. So with that said, there's going to be multiple approaches you can take with this. I'm just going to walk you through what worked for me. Uh, that is not the best practice. Uh, the, the, what my approach, I mean, was not the best practice. You could probably find a much easier way to discover these things. Um, but I'm going to show you exactly how I got through it. I find that when I share uh, even my uh, let's say misguided uh, approaches to solving reversing problems. Uh, it can help some people and, you know, again, kind of getting into that reversing mindset and seeing the different approaches. But I know there's going to be people who are like, ah, you should have known this, or, you know, there's going to be graphics experts who are like, oh, how could you not know that X library in windows is the key to this thing? I apologize in advance. I'm sorry. You're probably, there's probably going to be a lot of Ron Swanson like types doing the, I know more than you. Um, and that's fine. I don't mind. I've gotten used to it. Uh, I've done YouTube for a while, so that's fine. I'm just waiting for, uh, if you're wondering, I'm just waiting for this analysis to finish, but I think we could probably get started without uh, waiting for that to finish completely. I want to start with how I approached um, just learning a little bit about how the 2D graphics work in RCT. Uh, and this was the wormhole i didn't know it at the time but this was a huge wormhole that got me into a lot of reading which i'll share in the uh, description too when i first opened this up in ghidra the first thing i kind of wanted to know is in fact let's let's go ahead and boot up the game so we can um sure okay it looks like the analysis is just about wrapped up let's go ahead and boot this up uh one thing here if you are using a cd-rom like me i've actually intentionally done this little trick here to stop the game as it loads because I like to use the debugger to attach to it right when that prompt comes up for the drive. The reason this prompt is coming up is because I switched the drive that the CD-ROM reader is connected to. Again, this is kind of over and above because I doubt many people have the disk that they're gonna be working off of. But if you do, you can actually go into the registry and let's say you initially plugged in the CD-ROM or your CD-ROM's at like drive D, which mine is. Uh, if you go into the registry to this path here, if you're on a Windows 11 machine or similar, 
And uh, you can change that drive from D to like E is what I change it to. And what that does is it forces the game when you load it up to have this prompt. And I like this because typically I would go in here and I just attach to the, you know, or I'd open the executable or attach to it and just restart it as often as I needed to. But for whatever reason, I, I haven't quite figured out why if you do that, in fact, let me see if I can recreate it. I'll go ahead and load it real quick so I can show you. Um, oh shoot, I forgot to actually erase the breakpoints I had here. I'll go ahead and erase those. We'll come back to a lot of them later. Make them ourselves. I go ahead and play this. If I like needed to restart and I play the game and keep playing, I will go ahead and put this drive in. Oh, maybe I have to start it first. Let's try this. Play it. Oh, cool. No, now it's not going to do it. Well, the whole reason I went down this road is because <laughs> I can't believe that. The whole reason I went down this segue is because, uh, or this tangent is because uh, I was getting an error every time I tried to restart it. Oh, well, maybe it'll come up later. I was getting an error, so I was attaching to it um, at that point that it's asking or prompting for the uh, disk drive. But I will say the other advantage to doing that is I can attach before the full game loads, which is advantageous. Um, I don't have to set a breakpoint to like a certain point. I can just attach here and, you know, examine whatever before the rest of the game loads. That actually works quite well. So you're going to see me keep um, stopping the debugger and then uh, reopening the game executable when you might be screaming. For those of you who've used a debugger, you might be screaming, why aren't you just clicking restart? That's why. Um, so it looks like the bug I was getting before, the exception actually isn't triggering. But again, it's still convenient for me to attach there. So I'm going to keep doing it that way, just in case you were wondering. Anyway, I'm already going on a bunch of tangents. That's how these videos go. But I really like to get out as much detail as possible so that if you're new to reversing, you kind of understand why I'm doing things a certain way when you could be doing them other ways. All that said, First thing I did when I went to try to figure out how to manipulate the graphics so that I could do that whole clapping animation when the roller coaster crashes is to figure out what actually, well, I don't really have to open anything yet, figure out what actually happens to drive the 2D animation in Roller Coaster Tycoon. So I wanted to find some function or library or figure out what actually drives the painting of the graphics onto the screen? Is it, you know, I, I knew very little about 2D graphics when I started this. I mean, I still know very little, but I know a little bit more about Roller Coaster Tycoon's graphics now. Um, I wanted to know more about how they, are, you know, are they sprites? Are they animations? Is it more complicated than that? How does that work? So, that being said, we're going to close the game real quick, and I'm going to go back to Gita to talk about kind of how I did some static analysis to figure out where we're going to start here. So one thing I tend to do whenever I do any kind of reversing is, as always, look at the import list here. So the import list is showing you all the libraries that this executable is going to import. Um, some of them are included on disk. Others of them are just Windows standard libraries. The majority of them are Windows standard libraries, including this guy right here. And I didn't know, still don't know much about Windows 32, like Win32 animations or graphics. But if you look up gdi32.dll, and I've got the page here. Yep, let me bring over the window to this screen. We'll come back to that one later. Got all my tabs here. And again, all these links that we'll look at in the video, I'll include all of the um, useful ones in the description of the video. This one is a wiki page of all the Microsoft Windows library files. And if we go down to GDI32, it exports graphics device interface functions that perform primitive drawing functions for output to video displays and printers. Um, yeah, yada, yada, yada. So that was a good indicator to me, uh, looking at that in comparison to some of these other um, libraries here, that that's a good starting point. So I started looking at all these function names. And I wish I could tell you, oh yeah, I just you know opened them up in Ghidra and I was in immediately able to tell which one was the one that painted to the screen. No, that's not how that worked at all. Instead, I did the much more uh, unsystematic approach of setting some breakpoints on ones that I looked up that sounded promising and doing some tinkering with the uh, graphics, like the Windows options in RCT to figure out which one was actually painted to the screen. And when I did that, 
I quickly found out that stretch di bits was the one that I needed to target. Now, before we dive deeper into stretch di bits, which that's the correct pronunciation, I can't remember. I already can't remember if I just said that or not, or if I said stretch di bits or whatever. I think the, per ugh, the correct pronunciation that I read in documentation is stretch di bits. I'll try to keep that consistent. Before we dive into that, um, I want to point out that this technique of using this function is only used if the game is in windowed mode, not full screen mode, like we talked about in our uh, previous video, the whole first patch we did. And that's important because later I'm going to actually revisit uh, a topic from my first video that I didn't really explain well in the first video, the whole uh, cause of that black, uh, the black square effect that we saw in the, in the first video. I'm gonna come back to that at the very end because that's kind of gonna be an, a, an epilogue of sorts to this video. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you go to options here and you start the game, stretch di bits is only gonna be used if this display mode is set to window. If it's set to full screen, it's actually going to use a different library called direct draw. And you're not gonna see the same kind of effect that I'm gonna show you here. So just keep that in mind. Now, let's go back to Geeter here and talk about this function. So first, let me just go ahead and show you what I saw when I started debugging and looking at this function as a potential candidate, a potential starting point to look at how the painting was done for the graphics. So as we see in Ghidra, these are cross references, X refs. If I click on this, it's gonna take me here and it says, hey, this is used about four times in this current executable. Uh, the one we're actually looking for, and this is again, just through debugging that I figured this out. I set breakpoints on all four of these and this was the one that is called every time a scene is painted at 58D8C0. So let's go ahead and copy that address. And again, Ghidra has this nice decompilation here where you can see that a few functions are called in this uh, function that's in RCT. So realize palette, which we'll talk about in a little bit, stretch DI bits, select palette, release DC. All of these are graphical type functions. In fact, let's go ahead and label this function for later. We'll just call this um, draws to canvas, something like that. It doesn't really matter. It's just to keep it kind of unique in the listing so we can see exactly which which uh, version of stretch DI bits that we're using. And back over in the debugger, let's go ahead and control G to go to that address where I was talking about where it gets called. So let's go ahead and set a breakpoint using F2 here. And you're gonna see this breakpoint hit uh, every second basically. So let's go ahead and let me pull this over and pull this over here. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, actually it's because, there we go. It's because the game is locked up because every tick it is actually calling that stretch di bits function because, and you'll see this here when I click uh, continue in the debugger, it's painting a new scene. Oops, except I have it paused. Let's unpause it. Again, my click is not going to register until I keep repainting the canvas. There we go. And you can see with every tick, every time that gets called, if I do just a uh, F8 or a step over this function, every time that function gets called, you can see the animation goes again and again and again. So I knew this was a good starting point, but I didn't really know, again, a lot about Win32 graphics or the library or what stretch DI bits actually meant, or even what DIB referred to or DI bits referred to. Um, what I learned, and I'll pull this over from Firefox here, as always, by Googling and going to the Microsoft documentation at learn.microsoft.com, is the stretch DI bits function copies color data for a rectangle pixels in a DIB, which is a device independent bitmap. We'll talk about him in just a second, to the specified destination rectangle. So it makes sense that this is a drawing function that draws to a rectangle, basically our window, um, and it's got some color data in it. So it's getting the data for these graphics basically from just an array of pixel colors. And we can scroll down, we can see all the different information that stretch DI bits requires as parameters. So you've got destination to the device context. We don't really care about that. X coordinate uh, and Y coordinate of where we're painting. The width and the height that we're painting, that is kind of important. We'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Uh, the source re rectangle, uh, 
x coordinate, y coordinate, width, and height. So it's basically, you know, you can have a larger or smaller source. Uh, let's say our, you know, original source is smaller it may have to stretch those colors to a larger resolution. In fact, that's what happens when, let me go ahead and take off this breakpoint or disable it, I guess, temporarily by pressing space here in the breakpoint menu and go ahead and run the game so you can see this. It's basically got to adjust for every time you stretch this window, right? So it's got to paint a few more pixels every time you adjust the window. So that's what why we have both a source height and a destination height. Most importantly to us, we have a pointer to the bits that will be used as uh, basically the color input. So this is driving what gets painted to the screen. And second and most important is a pointer to a bitmap info structure, which we'll take a look at in a second. That contains information about the device independent bitmap being painted. And there's some other metadata here. Um, we may touch on that a little bit later. But for our purposes, I really wanted to learn more about these. So by looking at where this LP bits was pointing, we could see where the color data was in the running program. So let's step back. Let's go ahead and re-enable our breakpoint. And let's take a look at the stack because the stack is going to show us each of those parameters being passed in. So let's go ahead and move this over here. Move this over here so we can do a side-by-side. -side. Get my calculator open actually. And we'll switch over to programming and we'll switch over to hex here so we can do some quick maths. So we have, let's see, just so we can work this from top to bottom. This is our handle to device context. Again, we don't really need to worry about that. Uh, X and Y dest are both zero. So that's the top, uh, you know, upper left corner. Um, width and height. So 2C in hex. If we plug that into the calc over here is 715 so 715 pixels by 209 hex which is 521 that's about the size of my little window there and i can't see it again because i need to tick it i think one more time before it'll pop up and i may have just ruined that by clicking it again yeah anyway you can see it back here i'll just drag the window down um yeah so that's about what our window size probably is and if we go back to this, what's next? We've got our uh, X source, Y source. We've got source width and source, source height, which are the same. This is our pointer to the image bits, which we'll travel to in a second. And this is the pointer to our uh, bitmap info structure. So let me start by going to the image bits and in X64 debug or X32 bug, you can right click this value on the stack and just go to follow D word, double word, in current dump. So that's this little section over here. So let's go ahead and do this. We'll blow this up. What we're looking at, and we'll look at the documentation on this in a second, are a bunch of color entries. And if I go ahead and disable my breakpoint, and run the game, you can see, let's just scroll down to a little farther down. So this is basically just a giant map of the colors going across the screen right now in hexadecimal format. We'll talk a little bit more about how these get here and what these actually represent in just a moment. But let me just demonstrate this uh, by moving this little prompt here. Actually, let me load up my calmer. This is the end game of when I, when I played through. Let's load up this guy, which some of you who have been on the uh, community portion of my channel may recognize this uh, test I'm about to do as uh, a little teaser I did earlier to show you, kind of demonstrate this concept. So watch what happens when I move this window across the screen here. You can see, let's move up to this region here. These color values change as I drag throughout the window. And as I get more up here, you know, we're pretty, we're fairly high up right here in the screen pixels so as I move up you can see that those pixel values are changing and so that's just to demonstrate that as I'm you know interacting with the game as things are changing in the animation you can see that reflected in this this pointer you know, this memory section dedicated to the color values here so again this is going to come in handy in, in understanding how the game is actually painting these graphics to the screen. But 
just as I was when I first discovered this. I really didn't understand what was going on, but I knew that this was a good start. I could now see where the color data was coming. Uh, now it was to figure out how do I get this and translate these values to something that I can manipulate or work with. So let's talk about that next. So to learn a little bit more about device independent bitmaps and how these windows, you know, these old games kind of work with 2D graphics, uh, I ended up searching and stumbling upon some gold mines of cool nostalgic information on you know these really old websites i also went through and i tried to web archive or um, wayback machine a lot of these links so that they don't disappear i will put all these in the um, description for further reading i'm not going to read through everything or explain everything i'm probably going to do actually a poor job of explaining uh you know how the the palette and the device independent bitmaps and everything plays together i'm going to try to give you just enough information to help you understand because to be honest, it's been so many months that I forget all the details, but these websites, uh, specifically this CompuPhase one, uh, this one, which has a book by Charles Petzold, Programming Windows by Charles Petzold, I got lost in this for so long because this was such a cool read to like read about how people used to make graphics on like all Windows 98 computer. It was awesome. And a lot of these concepts actually carry over today um, to a lot of modern Windows graphics rendering. But anyway, I'm not going to nerd out too much on you now because that's basically this whole video. But there's a nice chapter here on device independent bitmaps. And also, I should say, in the official Microsoft documentation, I thought I had it pulled up here already. Maybe I don't, but that's all right. If I don't, I can go ahead and pull it up. There we go. And I'll go ahead and add that to the uh, video description as well. I just missed that one. So device independent bitmaps, um, as you might have guessed, there are bitmaps just like, you know, BMP files, image files that you may have seen before that are device independent. They can be rendered on multiple different devices, um, which is quite different from the regular bitmap format. Uh, for our purposes, there's some good information on this article um, about the structure, but I'm actually going to show you the wiki page in a second, which has a nice uh, visual. And also it alludes that we can tell if this is a bottom up DIB in which the origin lies at the lower left or a top down, which ours is going to be spoiler, a top down by looking at the bitmap info structure, which again, if we go back to stretch DIB or TI bits, I did it already and look at this parameter here. This parameter points to a bitmap info structure that has all this information. Again, we'll come back to that. Um, but you can look at that struct and you can see whether your DIB is top down or bottom up. And it also has a bunch of metadata about the height, width, and other uh, data about the DIB. The one that really helped uh, visualize the structure of the DIB was this wiki article about the BMP file format. Um, which has a lot of great information about the structure of DIBs. These are going to look at, we're mainly going to be looking at DIBs in memory, um, which is going to look a little bit different when we look at it in the debugger. So we're not going to have a lot of the header information. We're basically just going to be looking at the, if I blow this up here, uh, the image data, this guy right here, the pixel array. Um, that's what we're basically seeing in the debugger when we're looking at this section right here. And RCT, I think, uses kind of its own custom way of loading in that data. I don't know if it's typical of a lot of, you know, older 2D graphics. Maybe somebody else can chime in and tell me if the way RCT does it is typical. But anyway, it's neither here nor there for our purposes. Just wanted to let you know that this is kind of the section we're looking at in the debugger right now. And if you want to learn more about DIBs, please read through some of these. And if you want to really have a good time learning about, you know, old games and 2D graphics. These links were awesome. In fact, there's one more here. Is it this one? Not that one yet. This guy, writing hot games for Microsoft Windows. Hell yeah. This was also a really fun read. And what was cool about this is as I was reading about palettes and how people used to set up, uh, you know, colors and graphics for 2D games, if you go down to the code example they use here for creating an identity palette, so just like, you know, a palette, a default palette to use um, with some default values, look at this code right here. And if you look at the 
Roller Coaster Tycoon Executable in Ghidra. This is not relevant, by the way, to the mod, but I thought it was really cool, so I'm going to show you. If I go to that address in Ghidra here, and you look at the disassembly for this function, let me see if I can get a good side-by-side -side here. You can see this looks almost identical to the example code. And I'm sure like that's just because a lot of people used the similar, you know, same code, just like we do today as developers, um, reusing what we, what we can. Um, but you can see that this looks extremely similar to this code in this old, um, you know, writing hot windows games, things. But I thought that was just awesome to see, um, the similarities there. Anyway, again, I'm going to save you all the pain I had in those weeks and weeks of reading through this stuff. But if you're interested and you're a nerd like me and you like this stuff, um, check out those links in the description. Bringing us all the way back to the relevant stuff for the mod, we know that we can get two key pieces of information now from this call to stretch DI bits right here. And again, we just saw one, which was that pointer to the image bits, which have basically indices, which I'll show you where those go to in a second. And the other piece we want to see is this bitmap info structure that contains information about our DIB. And I've got that page open right here. So a bitmap info structure is just made of two elements. One is a bitmap info header struct, followed by a collection of RGB quads is what they call them. So the bitmap info header struct contains information about the dimensions of the color format. We're going to use that in a little bit. And then BMI colors here, like I said, is a collection of RGB quads, which I also thought I had up, but it doesn't look like I do. I'll make sure I get that one added as well. I mean, you can see, you can kind of jump from one of these to the other. So if I run out of, if I run out of space in the description, I might cut down these links, but RGB struct is just a byte. Uh, or I should say a collection of four bytes that have the blue value, the green value, the red value. So in the actual struct, they're in reverse order, BGR, and then a reserve byte and that must be zero. So what do we take away from all of this? Well, let's go ahead and start with the bitmap info struct because we know that in our debugger, we're going to have a pointer to that in the LP bits, or I'm sorry, the LP BMI uh, pointer that's right below the pointer to the image bits we just saw. So that is this guy right here. And we can follow this also in the current dump. And we've got some information here. So let's see if we can't do the same side by side kind of thing with the bitmap info struct here. So again, the first element of that bitmap info struct, let me drag it out here, is a, another type of struct called a bitmap info header. So let's take a look at that. All right, there we go. So a little bit of information about the bitmap info header. We're going to use a couple of data points from here, but not too many. Um, the bitmap info header struct contains information, like we said, about the dimensions and color format of the DIB, which is important. There's a couple of pieces of information here we're going to use when we get to um, dumping the DIB, the current DIB being shown to screen to disk, which I'll show you how we did in a second. And I'll talk about the code in much more depth later on in the video. Um, but yes, it contains a bunch of metadata. You can see all of them laid out here. Some of the most valuable ones are going to be, you know, the size, uh, required by the struct. Um, this does not include the size of the color table. This is just, uh, the size of the struct, which we see over here is 28 in hex, which is got the calc over in the other screen, 40 bytes in decimal. So the header itself is going to be, uh, 40 bytes. And actually, I think you can actually confirm that. I've got it open here. What I was doing when I was doing this uh, reversing, I've actually found it quite uh, helpful in this case, is ChatGPT. Um, I'm not one of those people who is convinced that ChatGPT is going to like, you know, immediately revolutionize coding because I've seen some of the mistakes it's made in some of my own uh, prompts. But I think it is really helpful for short stuff like this. Like, like if I say... What is the total size of this struct in bytes using 32-bit architecture? And I give it the struct from the page. If I don't know, for example, you know, how big a double word or a long or a word is, 
it says that the total size of the bitmap info header is 42 bytes. Okay, sorry. I literally, this is exactly, <laughs> this is exactly what I was talking about. I can't believe this happened. I thought I was tired because I'm, I'm recording this as usual. Uh, I have to do my work late at night because of family and job and everything. And I thought I was going crazy here. Uh, <laughs> we can see that the bitmap info header size is obviously 40 uh, here. It's, it's supposed to be 40. And I was looking here, I was like, 42 bytes, what? And I was doing this math. We have, make sure I'm not going crazy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times four, right? That should be 40. And chat GPT is telling me this is 42 bytes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus four. I, I'm at a loss. That is exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Maybe I'm tired. I'm missing something, but that should be definitely 40. And this is why I don't trust chat GPT just yet. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's 40 bytes. So that is the, uh, not that one, but this one, size of the struct itself. And that should stay c consistent. Um, and then we have other good information like the width of the bitmap in pixels, which we'll use a little bit later, and the height, of course. Um, and then some other metadata, which I won't get into because it won't be as valuable here, but suffice to say that this struct describes our DIB, which is helpful. Now, what's more helpful is right after this bitmap info header and the bitmap info struct, and I'm sorry, I know it gets kind of confusing between the two structs that are very similarly named, Right after this, so if we get 40 bytes below where this starts, we should start seeing our color table. So let's see if we do, uh, let me just take this address where it starts over here. So that's at, ugh, sorry about that. I accidentally added 40 hex instead of 28 hex, which is 40 decimal. So again, if we add 40 bytes, that's 2E42400. What that means is this highlighted portion here is gonna be our BMI header, the bitmap info header. What follows these 40 bytes is going to be this guy, BMI colors, which is again, an array of RGB quads. And this is essentially our color palette. And what I mean by that is when we looked, let's go ahead and pull this over a little bit again. If you remember, we looked at stretch DI bits and we got this value, which was the kind of the, the uh, image bits that were displayed. So let's go ahead and follow that and dump two over here. Uh, is that the right one? Yeah, I think I, did I do that? No, I think I I forgot to hit follow D word and dump, sorry. I just clicked follow and dump instead of follow D word and dump. If you do follow and dump, it's gonna show you this actual stack address here. You wanna follow the actual value that it's pointing at, which is that double word. So yeah, this looks more like it. So I kept calling these color indices. And what I mean by that are these are indices into this RGB quad array. So to break this down a little bit, let's take um, 0D for example. So that is, uh, if I bring up here, just for those who may not be familiar with hexadecimal as much, that's 13 in decimal. So that's the 13th element of this RGB quad array. Now, if we look at that RGB quad array, it starts right here and it goes on for, well, let's see. We look at the documentation and I believe it says right here, the number of entries in this array depends on the values of BI bit count and BI CLR used members of the bitmap info header structure. So let's bounce back there real quick for a quick uh, tangent here, just to talk about how to calculate the size of this palette or this color table. Um, right here. The size of this array is given by this BI CLR use member, this guy right here, number of color indices in the color table. If that's zero, then the array contains the maximum number of colors for the given bit depth, that is two to the BI bit count entries, basically. So that BI bit count is right up here. So two different ways to calculate it. For our purposes, actually, it's going to be just what's in the BI CLR used member. So with that in mind, if we look at that value of BICLR used in our program, it's going to be, so this is the end value, this is BICLR important, and this is BICLR used in our struct over here. Again, these are double words, so they're four bytes each. And remember, we're looking at this in little endian, so we're kind of reading this backwards. This value is actually 0000, 000 
zero one zero zero, which is just one hundred hex, which is two hundred and fifty six in decimal. So this RGB quad array has two hundred and fifty six entries. What does that mean for us? Well, if we look here, uh, remember that these are in the order of blue, green, red, and then a reserved byte, which is always going to be uh, zero here. If we look at these um, values, you can see that we start with all zeros and then 1110, 220, 330, 440, 5550. These are all indicating colors. So when we looked at this uh, you know, array of different indices into this color table, let's look at what the 13th element would be. And it's pretty easy to follow along here until we get to a certain point. This is the ninth element. This is where it gets tricky because we're no longer doing, you know, 101010. We're now doing a different color here. 10, which is A, B, C, and D in hex. So this is the 13th element right here. Sorry about that. I cut away real quick because I wanted to move the game screen actually to somewhere with more uniform colors because I think that'll drive this point home a little bit. To bring us back where we were before the cut, we were looking at the uh, LP bits, the pointer to the bits section right here, this portion of memory that holds all of these uh, color indices that are indices into the, the RGB quad array. That is this guy right here. So right after the bitmap info header, which we showed earlier, that's this guy right here. The color table starts right here. You're gonna hear me use color table and palette uh, interchangeably here, uh, whether incorrect or correct. Um, and that's where we start right here. That's our first entry in the, in the RGB quads. So if we look at value D in hex, which is 13 in decimal, that is this entry right here. Now, again, RGB quad, it's in uh, the way we're viewing it in this debugger is in reverse order than what you're probably used to seeing. So we're actually looking at the reserved and then the red and then the green and then the blue value in that order there. So backwards from what you're reading from top to bottom here. And if we go to paint here and go to our color wheel and oh, I should have brought this over first so I don't get locked there. Let's do this. Let's type in that value. So starting again from red to green to blue is going to be 3F5353. That gives us this kind of gray color. In fact, let's do uh, let's do a whole canvas of that color. So that is our top left corner, which makes sense because if we look at our game screen, again, it's frozen in place because I have it uh, on a breakpoint right now. That's this very tiny pixel up here that's at the start of the gray section up here. Now, the reason I moved this over to be a more uniform section of the screen is so we have this nice green uh, place taking up the majority of the screen or the window, I should say. And so if we scroll down in our color table, we should expect a majority of the colors towards the bottom to be kind of that same pattern of green. Now the trees are gonna mess with that a little bit, but if we look through here, the majority of these entries are like four, eight, four, eight, four, nine, four, eight. So let's see what the, uh, what is four, eight in decimal, 70, 72nd entry in the uh, color table is. So the way we can do that a little bit quicker is take the address at the beginning of the color table which is 2E42400, add 4, 8 times 4, because remember each element is 4 bytes. And I messed up my parentheses, and I think I messed this up there, so let me try that again. 2E42400 uh, plus 4, 8 times 4 bytes each. That gives us an address of 2E42520, which is going to be... What is that? 18, this guy, right? No, wait, 2E4, 2, 5, 2, 0. 2E4, 2, 5, 2, 0. Yeah, okay, there we go. Right, this guy right here. Sorry, my math is not mathing very well. So that gives us a, let's go back to our color wheel, 2F, a 4F and a 1F. Oops, 2F, 4F, 1F. Again, that's a nice green there. And if we go back here, you see that usually alternates with a 4, 9 next to it. If we look at the next entry, which is 4, 9, 
that's a 3b 5f27 which is that slightly darker green there so again that's just to demonstrate to you how that the color entries work in the game did i close my oh there it is it's behind there so these pixels that are right next to each other are slightly different greens and that's why we have two different indices shown here in the color table and again if you you know drag your screen or or um you know move something through that region you're going to see these values change to other indices into the same color table but i know that was kind of a, a deep dive into those two things but they're very important things to know that that whole section about the bitmap info header and the color palette and the way that the um, dib section indexes into that color palette because now that we know all of this we can actually extract the color palette being used and the current DIB being used from the game memory. Again, uh, I always include chapters in my YouTube videos and we're gonna discuss this in a much later chapter. The, we're gonna go into depth, I should say, in the much later chapter in this code. But here's the code that can dump and build the palette from a running RCT process. We'll come back to that later. I just wanted to show you that it's open there. For now, let's go ahead and run my master script here called RCT Horror Mod. And we're going to dump the current palette out along with the current DIB, which basically means when I say the DIB, I mean the portion that's rendered to the screen right now using a little Python script here. This Python script is going to read that data from the uh, the um, running RCT process. So let's use the dump command for that. I'm gonna go ahead and use the help option to see what we need. We need an output to save our palette file. We'll just call that palette.bmp and we'll call the DIB, DIB.bmp, keep it simple. So right here, what the script has done for us is it has located the DIB at D2340 and that is confirmed by what we saw in, oops, did I pause my breakpoint? No, we're still there. What am I looking at? There we go, I just had to reset my stack. That is right, this guy right here, the LP bits pointer. And it also located the bitmap info at this guy right here. And it helpfully parses out all those values in the bitmap info header for us. We can see uh, the size, the height. If you remember, this negative value here is negative because Go back to DIB here. I believe it's on this page. Yep. If the height is a negative value, it is a top-down DIB, meaning we work from the, the indices and the colors work from the top left corner and down. That's what that means. That's why that value is negative in case you were wondering. And then it located the color table right past the uh, bitmap info header and it got the resolution and it generated those two things. So let's go ahead and open up the two dump files here. Here is, let's look at the palette first, actually, and close all this. Palette is right here. Very small, let's zoom in. This is our palette, and I actually modified the script to dump it in a nice 16 by 16 grid. In memory, of course, is just one straight line. Here is our color palette visualized. So right here, this top left, very tiny pixel is, uh, going back to, let me get back to our color palette here. The first entry right here, all zeros, which is all black, of course. And we can see that the color palette changes from kind of a black and white uh, ray to this golden color and then to this brownish color again and again. And down here is where we get to the greens. Again, this is just visualizing all those colors that are in that color table. And so when we index into, let's say, you know, uh, index one, that's this second to left square right here, you get the idea. If we look at the dumped DIB, it's basically taken that color palette and recreated our window as we see it uh, without the header, of course, um, right here in this bitmap. All right, now that we've seen the demonstration, one important thing I wanna talk about that's, uh, again, I'm not gonna get too deep into the Python code yet until later in the video, but one thing I wanna talk about is how do we know where in memory uh, those two things are going to be number one the DIB and number two the color palette because if you watch if I go ahead and restart the program and let's start a new fresh session here 
and wait until we hit stretch di bits again, which is right here. Those two addresses are now completely different than the first time we did this. So this is again the di bits section. Let's go to dump two and put that in there. And then this is the bitmap info. We'll follow that in current dump. But these two addresses right here, different. Before, if we go back to our Python code, we had uh, the DIB was at D23 followed by four zeros. Now it's at D2 followed by five zeros. The bitmap info was at 2E423D8, blah, blah, blah. Now it's at somewhere different. So how does the Python script know where to look for those values? Well, that comes from a little bit of static analysis of this call to stretch DI bits. If we look in Ghidra here, and again, this is why I love this uh, decompilation view over here, and we look back and compare that to the stretch DI bits function uh, description here, we need to find the pointer here and here. And these are passes parameters right here. This is the bitmap info, and Ghidra helpfully tells us that it's a bitmap info pointer, pointer. Um, and then this is our LP bits pointer right here. That is at param1 plus uh, 84 hex. That's where we're going to find our um, LP bits or our, our bits section basically. And then at param1 plus 88 hex is where we're going to find our um, bitmap info. So let's switch back to the debugger because we don't know, uh, we know that this function, draw to canvas, uh, we know that this calls stretch di bits, but if we look at draw to canvas over here, there are, if you try to do the cross reference to that where it's called, you're not going to find an actual call to the function. You're going to find that it's stored in this data section right here. And if you click on that data section, there's quite a few places where this is referenced. And we're not positive exactly which one is being used specifically in this case. Um, to call stretch di bits or to call that draw to canvas function. Uh, maybe that didn't make sense when I said it <laughs> there. I know that's not a, a great explanation of what's going on, but I think it'll make a lot more sense if we flip back to the debugger and just take a look at what function, essentially this is the problem we're trying to solve, what function is actually calling uh, this draw to canvas function, which in turn calls stretch di bits. Because if we know what the calling function is, we'll also be able to find out what parameter it's passing in that is getting stored in param1. And if we can get that parameter, then we can do some simple math by adding 84 hex and 88 hex um, to get those two addresses that we need to parse the DIB and the color table. So to narrow down which function is calling draws to canvas, it's easier or easiest, I think, to go to our debugger and just set uh, or basically continue this. So let's, instead of continuing this step over one by one, or even easier than that, actually, let's go up here. This little arrow right here is a execute till return. So basically execute until the end of this function. Let's do that. And uh, this is one way you could do it. You could also, I'll show you the second way in a minute, but you can simply do one step past the return. And you can see that we were originally called from 5804D6. Now, the second way you could do that is go back to stretch di bits, simply look at the stack, scroll all the way past the parameters and local variables here, and you can see that the return address on the stack is 5804DC. That tells us that 5804DC is the instruction that's going to be run when we return from draws to canvas. So let's go to that address. I'm going to go ahead and copy it over from the debugger, make it easy, and let's go back to Ghidra and see what's what's being passed in as param1 right before. So let's go ahead and pass it in. Oops, did I copy the wrong thing? Oh yeah, I had this open earlier because I was trying to confirm. Sometimes I'll switch back and forth between Ida free and Ghidra because uh, it displays slightly differently, and I was trying to confirm uh, something earlier in case you're wondering why that was there. All right, I think I just copied the wrong value there. So let's try again. Go back here. Ah, close enough. Let me just clean this up and just get that address. Boom. So we can see 
that this function is the one that calls this, uh, basically it's using this uh, data as a pointer to a function. This is the one I just showed you earlier that ended up being a cross reference to the draws uh, to canvas function. So let's call this guy calls draws to canvas. I know it's kind of a confusing name, but it's just to point out that this is the function we're examining that actually makes the call to um, draws to canvas. And let's go ahead and rename this data section to, um, I don't know, pointer draws to canvas. Now we know that this, this uh, piece of data right here, this address is going to be um, a pointer that we can use. Again, let's go back to draw to canvas. That's going to be our param one here. So if we take the data in that pointer and add, uh, you know, 84 hex and 88 hex to it, we'll be able to quickly find uh, the two pointers we're looking for, which is the pointer to the DIB and the pointer to the bitmap info section. All right, not to beat a dead horse, but I know it's very, it gets very complicated for people who haven't reversed as much or haven't dealt with pointers to pointers to pointers. It can get really confusing here. So I want to nail this down, if you'll hear me, with one more example. Let's start with a breakpoint at where the draws to canvas function is called. So that's at this address right here. I've already got a breakpoint set in my debugger. So again, we are passing in this guy, which I've called pointer to pointer DIB because it's a pointer to a pointer, but it's really not a pointer to the DIB. It, anyway, name doesn't matter as much. Just wanted to set it aside and make it obvious that this is a pointer to a pointer. And we're going to use it to get the DIB as well as the bitmap info address. So that points or that that label is for an address at 8B CD C4. But we're not passing in that value to draws to canvas, A, B, C, D, C, 4. We're passing in the address at that address. So let's go back to the debugger and break it down. At, oop, I typed it in wrong. Eight, what was it? Eight C, no, I'll just copy it over because I've already forgotten what the full sequence is. Eight B, C, D, C, 4. We'll go to that in the dump here. That address holds another address. So it's a pointer to a pointer, basically. Again, little Indian, this is 02F10AB0. And that is what ends up being put on the stack as our first parameter. You can see that right here. So we've taken that address, ABC DC4. We've taken the address stored there and we've passed it into draws to canvas. Let's go ahead and line our disassembler the same way. Now we're right here at the start of this function. Let's go ahead and skip down to where we start using that parameter to get our bitmap info, and then the DIB right here. Now this is gonna be uh, in reverse order as we see it over here because we start pushing on the stack from the last parameter to the first parameter. So right here, this line is where we're gonna start doing the addition from that initial value we passed in, which is in the AX, um, back to our bitmap info pointer. So let's see that in the debugger. I've already got a breakpoint set right here. So again, we passed in 2F10AB0. That was the value that was stored right here at ABCDC4. Now we're going to do another dereference. But first, we're going to add 88 hex to this address. These brackets mean we're going to dereference that address and put the value at that address into EAX. Now, X64 debug does the math for us right here. This address plus 88 hex is 2F10B38. So let's go ahead and open that up in our dump. 2F103B8. What is, oh wait, did I type that wrong? 2F10B, I did, I totally did. Let me follow end up just by selecting it here. It has a nice feature where you can just right click this. I don't know why I didn't do this before. And just follow that value right here. Oop, followed it too much. Let's follow this address. Okay, what's at EAX plus 88 hex? Well, there's another address. And that address, my friends, is the pointer to bitmap info. So again, this is why we see so many asterisks here. The asterisk, if you don't know, uh, symbolizes a pointer. So we have a pointer to a pointer to a pointer kind of set up here. This final pointer is the address to our bitmap info. And if we follow that 
like I accidentally did just a second ago in the dump, this is the familiar start of our bitmap info struct here. So I just wanted to show you that we're dereferencing multiple addresses in turn, and that's how we get that bitmap info header. And we do the same thing. Let's go down a little bit farther. When we go to get our um, pointer to the DIB, we are adding 84 hex to the same address, to f 10 ab 0 That's going to bring us to this guy right here, which is another address, 0D200000, which is going to point to, we follow that again, our DIB, which right now it's all 0A because I restarted the game and it's frozen on this uh, title screen, which has the same color throughout, which is this dark grayish kind of color. Hopefully... That helped those of you who haven't worked with these kind of nested pointers uh, understand that a little more. And so, again, uh, those addresses that we followed end up being our parameters. If we go back to our call to stretch DI bits, those get pushed on the stack. And those are the two pointers we see right here. D2 followed by five zeros and then this 2F023D8. So that is how we were able in the Python program to calculate those is all we needed was that first address, the param one, which was 8BC DC4. And then we just took that and added 88 and 84 to it. And we were able to calculate, or we then moved through those, that kind of nested addresses there to get to the final destination of the bitmap info data and the uh, DIB data. And I'll walk you through that a little later when we go through the Python code in detail. But this is massively important because this is how we programmatically dump that data from the game. And this is our first step toward dumping out and understanding the color and the graphics that are being painted to the display. Why is that important? Well, let's talk about that next. All right, so I keep saying on and on, yeah, this is important that we found the bitmap info pointer and the DIB, but I haven't really explained why. And at the time I did this, I didn't even know if or why it was important or if it was going to help me at all. All I knew was that this was the first step I had toward better understanding the graphic systems. I now knew how the colors were painted to the screen and how they were selected and where the palette came from. Now the next step was figuring out how does the game decide which indices to put into the DIB section because that would tell me how the game loads the different graphics like the sprites or the different people or the pieces of the map, um, how all of those colors were being selected. Where did they come from? So to do that, I actually was in the same or similar situation here where I restarted the game to get a fresh palette or a fresh DIB, I should say, both really. And you'll see now that we've restarted, we've got this DIB section full of 0A. That's the index to this kind of gray color here. And I set a breakpoint just kind of randomly in this section. We'll say right here, set a hardware breakpoint. You do only get a limited number of hardware breakpoints. So you gotta be selective or go back and delete them when you're done. But let's set a breakpoint here. Anytime this byte is written to, we'll pause the program. It'll break on that. And it will show us in the code uh, what portion of the code wrote to that byte. So let's go ahead and test that. Now the problem we're gonna run into, number one, is that I need to disable this other breakpoint, make sure it doesn't choke us up. And let's just wait because, yep, there we go. So right here in the code, if you don't know this instruction, uh, STO SD, or I don't know how you would want to pronounce that, but that's how I'm gonna say it. That means store EAX, the value in EAX at address in EDI. So we're storing 0A, 0A, 0A into this address right here. That is not helpful to me, again, because I want to know when this data becomes something other than 0A00A, because that tells me that some other graphic is being loaded there besides that gray color. So to um, fix that, to make sure that we don't break when it's just passing in 0A00A, we can go to our breakpoint here, right click edit, and let's set a condition to only break when EAX is not equal to 0A00A00A. And we'll save that. And that should let us continue until this byte gets changed to something else. And we see that that takes place in a different section of code, 41DC4B. Now, 
I'm not gonna even try to actually look at the graph view in the debugger. I'll go back to Ghidra for this one because if you go to this address, uh, 41, let me just copy it over. Go back here, go to that address. Um, let's go ahead, this is really crazy to look at in any view, really. Um, but let's start by going to the graph view here. So let's do a function graph. And we get this really crazy section um, of loops and branches here. So let's take a closer look here. Uh, this function begins at 41D BCE. And uh, let's take a look at where we started here at 41DC before, what was it? 41DC4B, is that what it is? Yeah, right here, this, this guy right here. And let's see how it's loading um, the values into the address. So first of all, let me go bounce back to the debugger here. This uh, instruction right here, move SD, uh, is saying move. In fact, let's just pull up the assembly page for it while we're at it. There we go. Move the double word at address ESI to the address in EDI. So our source and destination. ESI is our source. So this is the address the data is coming from. This is the address the data is going to. So where does this source address comes come from? If we know that, we can see where the uh, source indices are coming from that are being written to this DIB region here. So let's go back to the this assembler and try to trace back into this code where that uh, ESI value comes from. And actually, this might be easier to see in the debugger, but I wanted to point out this is the loop we're looking at here. So it's right here that we see that movement into um, EDI from ESI. So the goal is to find where is ESI set first. And if we trace our way back to the graph first, we'll see that it's right here in this loop that EBX, the value in EBX, is moved into ESI. So let's bounce over to the debugger real quick. So here we're back at the bottom of that loop where that move SD command is. We're gonna jump back to the top of the loop and now we are back in the disassembler. Let's go to the graph right up here. So the first thing that happens is we read in a value into CX, the CX register here, from the address at EBX. Then we take that value, or at least the lower byte of that, and then move it into some address. Don't really care about that right now. And then we add two bytes to EBX. So it's like we took two bytes right here from the address at EBX, and now we're skipping over those two bytes. So we just took a value, stored it, moved past it, uh, in whatever array that EBX points to. Then we're gonna AND CL with 7F. Uh, that just changed that value slightly. It, it basically took out the most significant bit there. Don't really need to care about that. It's really this piece right here. Um, now that we have skipped past that first um, value we moved into CX and then in this address, we are now taking the new value in EBX and moving it to ESI. That ESI becomes our source down here for this move SD command. So that's where we're getting the data that's going to go into our DIB. So now that we know that, now we need to figure out, okay, if this value EBX is being moved into ESI right here, where does the initial value of EBX come from? because that will tell us that right now in this loop, we're kind of iterating through it, right? So let me bring back up the loop here. If we keep working through this loop, we're gonna keep incrementing EBX. We're gonna keep adding it back to, uh, move it back into ESI. We're gonna keep working through this region of memory, which let's go ahead and bring this up in one of our dumps. Um, call one dump two. So this portion of memory is where we're reading from right now. So what the heck is this thing? There's a lot of values in here. Where's that data coming from? Um, if we look at some of this data, so let me move actually to the top of this region here. Uh, so like, let's say, we'll just take, I don't know, just take a random line in here, like this guy right here. If we wanted to find out where the heck, actually let me copy the binary, not that line. 
if we wanted to find out if this data was located um, somewhere in the game files, what we could do is using bash or you know whatever whatever shell you want to. I'm just going to use bash because I know it has grep installed. Um, in my directory here, I have copied over all of the data that's on the disk for Roller Coaster Tycoon, as well as um, some of the data that's in the program files. Like the, well, let's let's just approach this as if we don't know what, which files they are. Let's just say we're looking through the game files, trying to find um, where the heck these values could be coming from. So in this directory here, in program files on Windows at least, Hasbro Interactive, Roller Coaster Tycoon data, are all the game data files that are installed on your computer. We can do a grep for, um, let's do a recursive grep. Let's use the P, the capital P to get the uh, Perl syntax recursive grep, and then O to just print the matches. Let's look for that string of data I just pulled out of there. Oops, except not the binary data. We could do that by adding A to the flags, but I actually want the text data here. Can I do that? Not super gracefully, no, but let's try that again. So let's just search for this pattern of G and H's right here. Oops, except I got my parameters out of order. This needs to go before my path here. And I need to clean that up again. Let me try that again. All right, so right there, I've just basically taken some ASCII, the ASCII representation of the same bytes we're seeing in this section. And I can see that the csg1.dat file, which is in my program files right here for the Roller Coaster Tycoon data, matches. And I've copied that file right here. Let's go ahead and open up that file in a hex editor. I'm going to use hxd. And here it is. So if we open csg1.dat in the hex editor here, look at this first line here and really look and memorize uh, real quick just these first few values. If we look at that and we actually go to where uh, we were looking at this value that was stored in EBX in memory, we went and searched through some of the values here. If we scroll to the very top of this memory section where that address is, the first couple lines are different data, but if we look at the third line of data here, we can see the exact same pattern from csg1.dat. And that told me when I first did this that the game is reading the data that it puts into DIB into the DIB section from the csg1.dat file. Okay, that's a little bit closer to the answer we're looking for. But if you look at the way this loop works, um, it, it does a lot of manipulation and indexing into that file, but it's not really apparent how it reads through the file. It's not sequential. It's not going line by line through csg1.dat and pulling out you know, every single line. It's being intentional in which data sections it's pulling out of here. And you can see that if you keep running through this loop. Um, for example, right now we're reading from cd7980b. And until we get to the end of this loop, we're going to keep seeing that section. Now the next time, let's go ahead and disable this um, breakpoint here so we can get to the next section real quick. Oops, uh, let me do this, let me disable it here, and then I'll re-enable it in just a second. And you'll see that next time, we're somewhere completely different in that CD address area, pulling out a different graphic. So at this point, I knew that we're getting the data from csg1.dat, but it wasn't super clear um, how, the game was deciding which portion of this file to get this data from. So to recap, we set a breakpoint, a hardware breakpoint in our DIB section to tell us when that section was being overwritten with data. We then saw this instruction right here, which moved data from the address in ESI to the address in EDI. EDI was our DIB. ESI was some uh, data section, which was read into ESI from right here. It was read in from EBX, put into ESI, and we discovered through the debugger that that was in this memory region right here, which seems to be a copy of csg1.dat. What we don't know still is how the values or addresses within csg1.dat are 
um, being selected by the game. How does the game know where to reach into csg.1.dat and pull out the various graphics? That wasn't entirely clear to me at this point. So we need to go a little deeper. Where does this value, uh, the initial value of EBX come from then? Where does this address come from? If we go up before the loop, we see that uh, right here, we add ESI to EBX. And even before that, we move the value at ESI plus EBX times two into BX up here. And I, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's go ahead and move back to the debugger at this line to figure out exactly what's going on here. So let's go ahead and go back to the debugger and see what's going on. So right here is where we, well, let me go ahead and disable this breakpoint for right now. So in the debugger, we can see that the first thing that happens before the loop is we move the value 88E8C0 or the value at that address into EBX. Okay, that's two zero. Uh, then we do some other manipulation. Then we move into EBX again, ESI plus EBX times two. So we basically take the value we just read from this address, we multiply it by two, and we add that to the address in ESI. And that's kind of our initial value that gets moved once we add it to ESI here into um, CX. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the initial address being passed in, this, this address right here, that comes from the address space that holds the data for CSG1.dat, that's stored in ESI. And after we move that from ESI into EBX, um, we basically initialize EBX with the starting point and that loop takes us through and you can see that it just basically iterates through that memory region. All that to say that it's really this first value of ESI that is our starting point for where we begin in CSG1.dat here. So if we can find out where that value is initialized, we can find out how the game is deciding where within csg1.dat to move the data or where to start uh, in that file to move data into the DIB. However, if we go back here to this function, we actually don't see anywhere in here where ESI is manipulated above this point in this function at least. That means we have to go to wherever this function was called from. And again, we can look at our call stack and see that in this case, we were called or we're returning to uh, 41DBCC. So let's go back to our disassembler. Uh, and if we look here at the top of the function, DBCC is probably closest to this guy right here. And I'm, I'm using a um, cross-reference here, but we could easily just go to right here and see it. But here's the function we just called. Let's go ahead and label this actually as, I don't know, let's say uh, fills DIB from CSG1. So this was the function we just graphed here where we had our loop. That was called from a couple of places, but the place that we're looking at right now was uh, right this guy right here. And I deduced that from looking at the cross references and looking at our return value, this return value was, you know, four bytes beneath uh, where this was. So I figured this was the place where it was called. And so we see that's right here. So our goal here is right before that function is called, find the last place that ESI was manipulated. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up the function graph because sometimes it's a little easier to uh, find it that way. Geez, this is a doozy of one. So we are currently down here. Let's see if we can find the last place that ESI is manipulated just by scrolling up here. And can you do some highlighting in this view? I think you can. Um, okay, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see a way to easily highlight the register name. So we'll just crawl up through here. And if we keep an eye out, we'll see the first mention of ESI and the last mention before we call our function is right here. So the beginning address comes from this data block right here. 
if we look at that data block right here in the disassembler view, we can see that it's referenced quite a few places. So I don't know if I've mentioned it in this video. I know I've mentioned it in previous videos. The W in these cross-references means that this value is written to at these locations. The R means that it's read from. And then the RW means it could be either one. In this case, we want to know where it's written to because if we can find out where this value comes from, we know what's being written into ESI here, which will eventually become the source address that we move data into our DIB section with. So let's go ahead and take a look. And if we look through a few of these write sections, you'll see a pattern emerge. So right here, the value in EAX has moved into that region, and that value is whatever EBX plus this address is um, at this point in the program. Now, we don't know that this exact cross-reference is the one that populated um, our data section here, but if we look across all of these, most of them contain that same pattern where a index in EBX is used and added to this section and moved into this address. So what does that tell us? Well, this is a hard-coded address at AFF714. And it looks like every time we um, kind of manipulate this value that's being moved into ESI, it's usually being read from somewhere in the data section at AFF714. So let's take a look at the debugger and see what's in that section there. AFF714. Interesting. Uh, a lot of like pattern data that seems to follow a pattern here, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So. When I first came up against this, I did exactly what we did with the DIB, which is I restarted the game and I tried to see what is initially put into this memory section here um, before the game starts, because that could give me a clue to if this data is somehow being read or manipulated by the game file somewhere. So let's do that. Let's restart. Let's go ahead and open up, or let's first of all start the game. And it's gonna prompt me for my drive. Let's go ahead and before we start, move to AFF714 and let's write, or let's do another hardware breakpoint where that's written to so that we pause as soon as that region is written to. So let's go ahead and click OK to start the game. Bingo, right here, we've written to this address. Now, this looks a lot different than when we saw it before in the middle of the game, right? So let's set a breakpoint on that last instruction which manipulated this, and let's see what happens here. So you can see that we're adding uh, to the addresses in these little rows here, a value which is stored in EAX here. What's going on there? Well, if we go to this region in memory, this, is our csg1.dat file right here. That's the address in EAX. We're taking that address, which again is decided dynamically when you run the game. So this is a different address than we got last time. And we're adding it to whatever these data values are in this AFF714 section. Interesting. So what that tells me is that these values are basically like indexes into, or indices into the csg1.dat file memory space here. And we're basically adding this address, which is the start of the csg1.dat file, to these indices so that the game is basically mapping where each of these kind of lines um, starts in the csg1 data section. I hope that makes sense. I'm realizing I'm not <laughs> explaining that possibly in the best way. Basically. Before these are written to, these are just indexes with zeroed out, you know, uh, top level bytes here. And whenever the game loads in csg1.dat, it then populates these values with the dynamically made address where csg1.dat, the data in there is located. And it adds that to these indices. So basically it's building up a table to various locations 
within CSG 1.dat. That sounds a lot better than whatever I said last time. It's quite late, by the way. It's uh, nearly two in the morning when I'm filming this. So in case you're wondering why my head's not always so there, I always tend to film these videos at night and uh, it shows sometimes. Hopefully that second explanation makes a little bit more sense. And something interesting you might've noticed, a clue is this string right here seems to indicate that this data might be coming from a different file, which is on disk called csg1i.dat. Could I mean index? I think so, because if we look before this data is kind of um, overwritten with the dynamic address of csg1.dat in memory, let's just take this index right here, which has yet to be um, added to this address up here. Let's copy that value. Uh, copy the binary rather. Um, and let's go back to grep here. And again, remember I've copied the on disk files to this folder on disk right here. So csg1i.dat should be in there. I've also made a local copy of it here. So let's just do a grep. I'm going to do a a flag here, which will allow me to do um, binary data. And let's do, what was it? Uh, I do have to add a backslash x to indicate these are bytes. Let's do a grep on csgi.dat. Oops, csg1i.dat. And we have a match. Now you could also, the way I did this first before I knew that, or before I confirmed that it was from csg1i.dat, is I just did a recursive grep in the on disk files, and that kind of confirmed it for me. So you could do something like this. And you can see that csg1i.dat matches that pattern. So again, to recap, let's go ahead and open up the hex editor actually, because it'll be a little bit easier to see what I'm talking about. The game, before we get started, loads in csg1i.dat, which has these lines, they're about 16 bytes each line. And it looks like these first four bytes are supposed to be an index into csg1.dat. And the way the game handles this is at the beginning, before you're even started, before the window's even up, it takes that section where csg1i.dat is lo located. In fact, let's go ahead and restart um, to look at this one more time. And now we have a breakpoint set there, so we should catch right when it happens. First, I have to enter my drive number, or my drive letter, rather. There we go. So let's go to section AFF714. Uh, and we see that this right now matches exactly what's in csg1i.dat. The game is taking the dynamic address of where csg1.dat is located right here. We open that in dumb two, you can see that matches this file right here. And it's using csg1i.dat to index into that file. And that's how it's selecting which graphics get painted where. So let's see that in action if we run. So we've added zero to this address. That's the start of the file. Next line we add, what was it, 5C. Next line we add C0, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically building an indexed table into csg1.dat. Okay, Jeff, uh, why is that important now to what we're trying to do with these graphics? Well, now we know that csg1i.dat is an index into csg1.dat, which makes sense. That's why they're named as such probably. We know that csg1.dat contains the data that gets painted to the DIB, so it has the color information for the various graphics. What we have yet to learn is how to actually take the indices from csg1i.dat and convert those into sprites or you know, individual pictures that are being used in the game. And this, my friends, is the first point <laughs> at which I wanted to totally give up on this video because I tried to manipulate this. I tried to go to these indexes and some of them seem like they were bitmap data, but it wasn't super clear how the game was deciding how to read that data. It wasn't like a typical bitmap data structure. Some of these were, some of these weren't. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out exactly what was going on here. I went probably 
a good two weeks of coming back to this, you know, sporadically throughout various nights of the week, trying to look through these files and figure out exactly how they were related to each other. And after weeks of debating whether I should just give up at this point, I struck gold in the wildest way in this old early 2000s website dedicated to archiving the technical information behind Roller Coaster Tycoon. So this was, uh, I think the last post was in 2014. I think the original site, I can't remember where I saw it, but I want to say that the original writing of this page was somewhere maybe in early 2000, 2002 or something. Regardless, um, to the gentleman who made this site, I can't remember if he names himself here, James Hughes, thank you. God bless you. Uh, and all the people who contributed to this. This was incredible for me to finally find, and I can't believe I didn't find it sooner. I just took a little bit of Googling to find it. On this website, James and his uh, comrades who discovered all this file, file data in RCT originally put together everything they know about the various data files, like the save files, the scenery files, all this stuff. So you, I, I'll put this in the description, of course. You can go through and look. I've also archived this website because I could not have done this uh, without James's website and this page specifically, which exactly describes how the data in csgi.dat and csg1.dat are related. And actually it wasn't James who discovered this, but Henry Winkelstein. And let me tell you, I did not have a uh, reading into RCT hacker lore on my bingo card when I started this video, but boy, am I glad that it ended up there because looking through these old forum posts by this gentleman, Henry Winkelstein, he was a character and I am specifically mentioning him because, uh, he was the one who discovered this, you know, how the layout of the CSG files were, um, laid out. And where is it right here? Second line. Remember where you got this information. You saw it here first. I don't want to see anybody else claiming they figured it out by themselves in the future. In particular, Dr. J, you are welcome to use this information on your site. Henry Winkelstein was very adamant that he was the one who discovered this. And power to him. He was apparently the creator of a tool called um, the, where is it, TRG Trainer, which was like an early RCT kind of extractor or hacking tool. And there's an interview here. He's just like, oh, just a really weird character. I think this was from, oh, there it is right there. 2002, July, 2002. I'm going to leave these links there for you to do further reading, but I had such a fun time reading into this lore and these debates and like these rivalries even of RCT, early RCT hackers and their opinions on Chris Sawyer and the way he did things and like the different things they found. Truly at this point, I felt like I was standing on the shoulders of giants uh, and reading about this history and seeing this. It was just such a cool feeling to see 20 years ago people doing a lot of the exact same things we're doing right now, except with far less capable tooling back then. And so this really humbled me when I came across this. And it saved me when I found this write-up on the different formats in the CSG1i and the CSG1.dat files. So let's talk about this uh, and we'll talk about it more in the Python section. But essentially this describes how bitmaps are stored in csg1.dat file. So basically each row in this csg1i.dat file is a what's called a t-graphic record struct. And that's made up of a four byte start address, which we talked about. That's a, basically added to the starting point of csg1.dat in memory and it's an offset into csg1.dat where the image is stored. Two bytes to describe the width, two bytes for the height, two bytes for the X offset or where the, uh, we'll see how that works when we discuss the um, uh, compacted bitmap, but that's basically an offset from the left side of the uh, image, the Y offset, and then a flag, two byte flag, and then two, two bytes of padding at the end there. Down here, we talk about the types of flags and what they indicate about the data in csg1.dat. So for any image here, like this one, that has a flag of a value of one, 
that means that this is a direct bitmap, meaning that whatever's at this address in csg1.dat, we're gonna read those pixels directly as if they were indices into a uh, palette, basically the color palette at least. So that's pretty easy. We basically take width times height, we scan that many pixels or indices from csg1.dat at the starting address here, and then that is our image. Uh, and I'll show you that again. We'll, we'll go more into depth with this when we get to the uh, Python section. Now the compacted bitmaps are a little bit different. These are the ones that have the five flag. Like the first element in csg onedat is a compacted bitmap. These are basically prefixed with this scan line data. So this is basically an, ind or an offset saying, hey, offset hex E from this location, so E right here, contains pixel data um, that's offset from the left side of the image. And this is where the X offset comes into handy. And I like the example that um, he uses here of like a 2D ladder. How this works is instead of just reading indices into the color palette, let me pull up paint here so we can see this and let me get a black background here. So imagine that we start with just a completely black square here. And let's go ahead and get the pencil tool and get uh, like a tan color. A compacted bitmap is just going to tell us, um, let's see, like a graphic of a vertical ladder. So most of the scan lines, if we think of scan lines being like this line followed by this line followed by this line on the screen, it's going to tell us the offset from the left of where the colored part of the element begins. And then that it's gonna give us the um, color or the index uh, into the palette for that color. So for the example of the ladder, for example, um, we're gonna start with an all black image. And then let's say it says, hey, at index um, I, let's say, there's a entry for color palette, entry, I don't know, E. And that, let's say the, the color at that part of the palette is like a tan color. So we're gonna put a single pixel at that offset from the left edge right there. And maybe if we're looking at a ladder, in fact, let me zoom in all the way. And so to the pixel level, so we can see this. The next entry is going to tell us in that same scan line, where's the next colored pixel. And let's say it's all the way over here. And then it's gonna say, okay, that's the end of that scan line. Now move on to the next scan line okay, now there's another pixel colored here. Now there's another pixel colored here. And it does this until we get something like, it's gonna be awful for me to draw it by freehand. Yep, not straight lines at all. But imagine that this was a straight lined 2D ladder. Basically, this is a way to, we, we wouldn't want to um, put together a whole bitmap that just is full of black and then just very small set of pixels that are one color. So this is a way of condensing that data into a, into a um, smaller format so we can have more of that into one file. So we basically just store what pixels are colored against the black background, and then we draw based on those offsets on each scan line where those pixels are. That's, again, put simply what a compacted bitmap is. When we get to the Python section, we'll explore that a little bit more. It does get a little complicated to explain. But whereas before we're loading in an actual full picture, in this case, we're loading in specific offsets in each scan line that are colored. And the reason they did that is because if you think of like the guest um, in the Roller Coaster Tycoon, I'm not going to draw them uh, very well here in paint because I'm not a good artist in general, but each guest, you know, they have a shirt, they have pants, but they all have different colored shirts and same thing for the roller coasters they might have different colors and so by specifying um which pixels make up this guest graphic but leaving some of the pixels blank they can swap out some of these background pixels with whatever color the game or player chooses so like if i want an orange shirt graphic i just switch out this region with orange if i want a green shirt guest i switch it out with a green color um, that's kind of the idea between or for the compacted bitmap, I think, with RCT is number one, it saves space in the file. And number two, it allows you to kind of swap colors 
instead of just reading all of the data directly, like with a direct bitmap. Hopefully that explanation made a little sense. Like I said, when we actually get through and extract the bitmaps, you'll see a little bit more what I'm talking about. And finally, then we have the palette entries. These are straight up just RGB quads that will explain the palettes. And we'll see those in a second, but uh, you'll see those that have a flag of, what is it, eight? I don't know if we'll be able to spot them. I think I remember they're closer to the end of the file. Anyway, you'll take my word for them. There's a few eights in here that are hidden there. There's different color palettes because different levels and different screens um, have different color palettes they need. Uh, so the game will switch the palette based on what screen you're on. In fact, if I, let me detach here. If you look at the color palette for the start of the game here for the graphic that comes up when this is done, like right, uh, wait for it. Right here, this screen has a much different palette than this screen. So let's go ahead and do, let's look at, this is the palette that we dumped earlier. That was just the regular game palette, this guy right here. I actually saved the palette from that first Roller Coaster Tycoon screen so you could see the difference. You can see the very different, whoops, not zooming in the right part there. Let me zoom in, hello, VS Code, hello. There we go. You can see it's a very much more purpley uh, palette there. So the game has different palettes that it uses based on the context of where you are. And this is the one we got from kind of the main screen and the, and the game screen. So again, all that to say that this page saved this video, basically. I probably would have given up on trying to discover this myself, but with this information, I was able to code up a bitmap dumper so that I could dump all of the information out of csg1.dat using the indices in csg1i.dat and the color palettes I extracted from the game. And it's really just this color palette that the majority of graphics are built with anyway. So that said, I'll discuss the code in detail later as usual, but let's take a look at what that looks like. So this script, if we do the help option, has another command called bitmaps, which given a palette file in the csg1.dat file and the csg1i.dat file, will extract all of the uh, bitmaps from RCT into whatever destination you give it. So before I actually run that, let me make a directory to store these in. What I didn't understand at the time is just how many bitmaps RCT's creators managed to stuff into these relatively small files. I mean, let me look over here. CSG1 CSG1i.dat is a little over a thousand kilobytes. CSG1.dat is a little over 40,000 kilobytes. I think total size is 40 megabytes, basically. That's relatively small. And yet when I initially did the dump, let's see here, and I regret saying it that way, but when I initially uh, ran this command to dump all the bitmaps, again, I'm passing it all the necessary data here. I was astounded by the metric butt ton of bitmaps they stuffed into this game. And for those of you who uh, are in the are in America and don't use the metric system, a metric button is approximately. Let's run this. Uh, oops, I forgot my outdoor. Oh, the fans are going. Metric button is nearly seventy thousand bitmaps in this game. That is insane to me. In fact, when I go to that folder, I'll pull it over in a second. It basically chokes the Windows previewer in Windows Explorer because. There's so many bitmaps in there. So I actually, what I ended up doing is I installed Irfan View, which uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've pronounced it for years like that, which has a little bit uh, easier thumbnail view that we can open up that specific folder. So let me do that real quick. And even Irfan View has to chew on that for a little bit, but you can see there's so many bitmaps of different angles, different uh, textures and environments and all the pieces of the rides and levels. It is absolutely wild. Now, the other thing I like about Earth and View is when you click here, uh, I can zoom in. Oops, not like that though. Let's zoom in like this. 
Oh, maybe I just do this. That'll be easiest. Can't remember what the shortcut is right now, but I'll just use this. You can zoom in to a certain point. Let's back off a little bit. And you can lock the zoom, which is nice for looking at these teeny tiny little bitmaps and looking at the different structures and everything they include in this game. Now, the next step I wanted to find out now that we made it this far is can I find where the uh, clapping graphic is so that I can figure out how that whole clap at the end of a win scenario works and I could manipulate the graphics to have that play uh, when an explosion happened. I also wanted to find the explosion graphic because that would tell me more about um, you know, how that how that explosion um, is carried out in the game logic. So those were the two things I was looking for. So to find number one, the explosion graphic, and number two, the clapping graphic, I designed a Python computer vision project that would look for the semblance of a clapping avatar. I'm just kidding. I absolutely did not do that. I actually clockwork oranged it and literally went through all 70,000. And honestly, I don't regret it because as I was doing exactly what you're seeing on the screen here earlier, I was just watching this in almost a hypnotic state, just in awe of the graphics work that went into all these different rides, all these different angles of things. Someone had to design, and I'm sure they had some, you know, coding logic to help manipulate some of the similar ones, but like these faces, somebody had to draw each one of these faces. Somebody had to write every ride, every icon for every ride. Somebody had to make these. And I was just in complete awe of the work that goes into making these, you know, 2D graphic games that we kind of see as players somewhat simplistic these days, but it's incredible the amount of artwork that goes into these. Now, real quick, right, right there, I wanted to show you something. This is that opening screen we just saw that was purple in the real game. You can see it's really distorted when I output it, and that's because I'm using the wrong palette. I'm using the palette from in-game. If you remember, there was a separate palette, this guy, that was used for that image. And because I told my script to use the other color palette, some of these images, if they were meant to be used with another color palette, are gonna be a little distorted. But for our purposes, the majority of them are gonna be just fine. And that works for us. So just keep in mind that some of these might be off color. Now, I'm gonna skip ahead for you to show you exactly where um, I found the things that I was looking for, because like I said, I just clockwork oranged it and just went through all of them just to see. So I very intentionally named these after their decimal and also their hex address in uh, csg1.dat. So basically the reason I did that is if we go to csg1i.dat, I can search for this hex offset right here. So this is little Indian, remember, so it's backwards. 13, or I should say 0223BF13. I can see that that is at offset FA750 and csg1i.dat. So that is, this row right here corresponds to this graphic right here. And that offset is an offset into this file to this location right here. And it's obviously bigger than this, but I just highlighted the first part of it right there. So that's how the game is kind of deciding which graphic to put where. Now that I know this information, I can at least start to try to understand how the explosion, for example, is triggered when the coaster crashes. And the way I could do that is, let's go ahead and start up RCT again, because I think I closed it. Let's go ahead and hook into it with the debugger. Knowing this information, let's go to the region we know um, that the CSG1i data is going to be loaded and our breakpoint should stop us. So let's go ahead and continue before. There we go. Breakpoint stops us right as that's getting populated. And now I can go to, there's two ways I could do it. I could either search for these values or I can just go to the offset plus AFF714, which I'll do that one. Let's do the calculation here. AFF714 plus the offset FA750 is BF9E64. BF9E64. Let's set a breakpoint. And I can delete my other ones actually because we shouldn't need them anymore. I didn't mean to open patches. Uh, there we go. And let's set another breakpoint for when this is accessed. Because whenever it gets accessed, 
that'll show us in the code where the explosion is triggered uh, in the game logic. Now, the first time this is accessed is probably gonna be right at when this gets written to. So let's see if I'm right there. Let's go ahead and disable this breakpoint right here for now. And sure enough, yep, the hardboard breakpoint was triggered at that location because we just overrode it with the address from CSG1.dat. What we really want is to break when it gets, uh, I can go ahead and disable this one, or actually I can delete this one now. We're past this point. I will be able to now break whenever the explosion is triggered and find exactly in the game code where that image is accessed. And that's gonna tell me what part of the game code is actually triggering the explosion. The reason I went about it this way is because I knew I wanted to get the explosion and the clapping happening at the same time. And so this was gonna give me that insight. So let's go ahead, I actually have a save game right before an explosion was triggered in my skelly test. And let's pause real quick and go over to where the already airborne coaster is about to crash. So if we did this right, we should get a break right when that first image of the explosion is accessed right here, as soon as the impact is first made. So let's go ahead and unpause and watch what happens in the debugger. Boom, first car hits and we immediately stop right here. Again, we can see this is the part of the code we were looking at earlier where AFF 718, or I'm sorry, it's actually the line before we stopped, AFF 714 plus EBX, which is offset FA750, just like we expected, which is right there in CSG1i.dat is being accessed. And next time uh, the screen is painted, that explosion graphic will be painted to the DIB. Awesome. So now that we see that the offset from CSG1i.dat is put into EBX here, if we follow this call chain all the way up, and I'm actually gonna open this in Ida because in Ghidra, I'll show you here, when you graph this, it doesn't really graph uh, the entirety of the jump table like Ida does. And this is why I bounce back and forth between them because in Ida, it becomes a little bit more clear that this section of code here, if you keep returning from where we see this uh, index put into EBX, eventually, you'll get back to this address at 416BE1 right here, in which we see EBX is given the value FA75. Now, you'll notice that that is missing the zero at the end, but when we are actually, oops, not the OBS, but this one, when we're actually in, uh, let's go actually, let's go do this. Let's take this address where this is, initially called and put this into the debugger uh, right here. You'll see what happens here with EBX. So it's given FA75. Eventually it's gonna call into this guy and then down the line here, we're going to shift EBX to the left by four, which is going to get us that FA750. So now we've identified kind of how the game is loading in these indices to these different graphics, at least in the explosions case. It took that index, FA75 in hex, and then shifted it to the left. And if you'll notice, there we go. All of these will end in a superfluous zero. That's just the way they're lined up because they're all 16 bytes. And so, the program will always take a four byte index, which is just the four bytes right here, and then shift it to the left four bytes to get the full index to get into CSG one dot dot. I hope that makes sense. Again, using the example of the explosion, we're taking a slightly shorter index of FA75. We're gonna shift that to the left to get FA750. That tells the game to load whoever's at offset Let's just go to, can I do a go to? Yeah, FA750, which is this guy in CSG1.i.dat, which points to the address of the explosion bitmap here. What a doozy, right? Uh, that is crazy, uh, thinking back on how long it took me to figure all this out. But now that we know that, um, we have discovered something interesting. And that is that this 
the the changing of the explosion bitmap is as easy as changing the index we have right here. So let's just set this to something completely different in the debugger and let's see what happens in the game when we do that. And I forget that I can't I gotta minimize everything to get back to the game here because it's kind of frozen in time. You shouldn't even be here. You should be over here. There we go. So we should get that explosion again because this every car is going to explode that same way. This time, let's break right here. Let's change this instruction, the debugger, to something different. It can be whatever. Um, wh whatever is an index, an actual index in the table. So let's say uh, we change it to a few indices above that. So let's go to FA6D instead and see what happens. So let's go into the debugger. We'll do a, what is it? Do you just click on it? I can't remember what the easiest way, binary edit. There we go. Uh, let's do FA, what did I say? I don't know, FA60. So again, little endian, so FA6D. We'll change that and let's see how the game reacts this time when it paints to the canvas. And we're gonna have to do it a couple times because it's gonna load this quite a few times. In fact, let's temporarily disable this breakpoint so we can speed that up. And we see this time it's loaded in a completely different graphic, which is up here, one of these. I can't tell exactly which one. I think it's, uh, well, I had it there. There we go. F80 zero. It's probably this guy right here, I think. Yeah, that looks, yeah, that looks like it. So a piece of a house or something that's been painted in. And this is how I got the idea to make this even more horrific, to replace that explosion animation with something a little bit more sinister. And for me, the reason this, some of you have seen this in the, in the teaser, um, for me, I changed that to go back to the debugger. And this time we'll change, we'll re-enable this and change it back to B9, what is it, B9 for A? Because that is a nice, disable again, scary skeleton. So it gives us this really weird overlapping skeleton, spinning skeleton, uh, which is from one of like, I think one of the haunted rides or one of the levels that has spooky stuff in it. So all of these right here, we're basically just starting off the animation at this guy and then it runs through just like it did with the explosions, except it's going through the spinning skull angle, which was obviously not what the game intended, but it makes a little cool effect. So I decided to include that in the final mod as kind of another creepy unsettling thing we could do is changing that explosion animation to the skull bitmap but you could choose any bitmap uh, in here that you want um, i'm sure you could come up with a ton of different things you could do with the explosion and now that you know that um, you could probably manipulate some of the other places where the game uh, draws these indices and you know draws different images from Hi, Jeff from The Next Day here, and I feel much more refreshed. Uh, at some point of recording during the late night and wee hours of the morning, you start getting diminishing returns where you become the guy who's just screaming hexadecimal calculations into the ether. So I've rested now. I feel much better. And we'll do a quick recap and pick up right where we left off, which is we discovered, and I, you'll notice I switched up to Ida here again, just because Ghidra has a hard time with these jump tables in particular, rendering these in these functions. So I popped over to the IDA free version. I'll also include a link to that in the description. And uh, we discovered that we could find where the explosion animation is triggered by looking for its offset in the CSG1i.dat file, which was uh, FA750. You'll notice we cut off the zero th there, just like we talked about uh, the program ends up shifting that so that you end up with uh, FA75 being the actual uh, reference in the program. And we talked about how we could change that hexadecimal value to put in any bitmap that we wanted to uh, from the CSG1i.dat and CSG1.dat files, such as the skeleton or the skull that we, uh, we played with in the example. 
So from there, now we know how the explosion stuff works. How does the actual applaud animation work? Because that's really the crux of this vision that I had was that really unnerving uh, breaking of the fourth wall where all the guests look up at you and start applauding and jumping up and down. And looking through the same bitmap dump folder. There we go. I had it highlighted, but I must have moved my window or something and, and gotten it uh, back at the top. But it's right here at uh, the address, hex address, 1515B7D in CSG1.dat. This is the what I assumed was the beginning of the clapping animation because it's actually one of the only of a very few number uh, of bitmaps where the guest is facing right at the camera and I have moved back to Windows Image Viewer so I won't be able to do the nice trick of locking the zoom but you can see that the next few look a lot like that jumping up and down animation and the clapping animation taking place so I was pretty certain that it was this first one right where is he right here uh, that was our starting point and that's at again 1515b7d so let's head over to our hex editor and search for what offset that's going to be at. If we search for one, or it's going to be in, again, little Indian, so backwards, 7D, 5B, 1, 5, or I'm sorry, 5, 1, 0, 1. That's at offset C2, 8F, 0. So when I was first looking into this, I thought, oh, well, if the explosion was just, you know, finding the offset and shedding off the zero there and searching for that value, Maybe we can do the same for the applause uh, value. So let's try that. If we do a 0x C28F, we get uh, absolutely nothing. Or we get some uh, we get some matches, but they're not the C28F uh, that we're looking for. At least not in the same context as when we search for, I'll show you when we search for the uh, immediate value of the explosion, which was, what was it, one more time, FA75, we just searched for that, you can pretty quickly home in on this guy right here as an add instruction, and that's how we kind of narrowed it down. The clapping does not work exactly that way, and to save you some time of static and dynamic analysis, I also went through... Um, played through the wind condition and checked, and it indeed works a very different way to actually load in that uh, particular offset. And I think the reason it works so differently is whereas with the explosion, you're kind of loading that animation in at a single point. For the clapping animation, you have to load it across multiple character sprites, right? Because there's gonna be multiple characters who play that animation. So I think that's why the mechanism is a little bit different. But that makes things a little complicated for us because how are we supposed to find where in the code we need to uh, manipulate to get this clapping to trigger? Well, when I started thinking about this, I kind of got creative. I hesitate to call it creative because it's really not that creative. <laughs> I decided to just play the game all the way through to a win condition, which was a bunch of fun. And I'll go ahead and load up our game again so we can hop in there and attach to it. And just to take a look in the debugger, oh, that's quite loud for me. There we go. Um, take a look in the debugger at what happens when that win condition is triggered. So let's go ahead and attach here. Oops. T. And I've got a save file from right before uh, the win condition is triggered right here. Uh, ignore my park and the quality of this park. Again, this was for fun. And uh, my staff assures me that these benches are still serviceable and I hired them right from the VA, so they, they can't be wrong. Anyway, we're gonna do the same thing we did with the explosion offset, which is we know that it's gonna be at AFF714. Also, in the last 24 hours since I cut there, I just learned, I've been using X64 Debug for years now, and you've seen in my videos, I always do my calculations in the Windows calculator and then plug them in here. You can, you can do the calculations in the debugger, it'll it'll do the hex calculation for you. So when I do C2BF0, or was it C2BF0? I feel like I got that wrong. What was it? It was C28F0 rather. It'll take us 
to the right address. I don't have to plug it into the calculator every time. I cannot believe I didn't know that. Well, now you do if you didn't before. Um, so hopefully that'll help you save some time. Anyway, we're gonna do the exact same thing we did with the explosion animation, which is set a breakpoint on this double word right here and see whenever the program accesses that um, index. So let's see what happens. So there's the break. If we take that approach, and again, I'm just doing this as an example. This is, we'll end up taking a different approach here, but I wanted to show you kind of my first attempt, which was to replicate what we did with the explosion. Uh, we get a break at 41D736, or really at 730 is where the, um, the access to this offset in CSG1i.dat takes place. So if we open up Ida and go to 41D730, we see that it is loading um, whatever offset from AFF714 is in EBX. Where does that EBX value come from? Well, it comes from whatever function called this. And if we look down here, this was called by 42938D. 938D. And it looks like EBX was originally derived from, if we scroll all the way up, up here, EBP plus zero. And right before this function call, the value in EBP is actually pushed to the stack. I've lost my place now. Let me go back and forward one more time. Uh, right here, there we go. So if we look back in our debugger, the, that value should be right on top of our stack, this guy right here. And if we go to that section of memory, we can see indeed that C28F is stored in that location. But if you search the same region, or I should do it in Little Indian, I think. C28F, I think this is the way. Yeah, you can actually see it set in a couple of places in that region. And this is what I was talking about. This was the initial discovery I had that this works a little differently than the explosion in that that offset is loaded into multiple places. Um, and I think what's going on, this is just a hypothesis. I didn't dig too much into it. I think there's an action done for each of the guest sprites, like I talked about where that offset is lined up as the next animation to be played for this particular guest. And so I think that's what's going on and that's why it's not quite as easy to derive, um, you know, manipulate or derive where the, the applause animation is taking place. So scrap that, let's take a different approach. The next approach I took was looking at all of the different win scenarios for the original RCT. There's a pattern here. Um, most of the time, you're looking for either park value um, win conditions or you're looking at a number of guests plus rating condition. And if you look at the rating, in every single level, uh, the rating is the same, the win condition rating is the same, at least 600. So I thought that was interesting because maybe we could look through the program and find a comparison that looks for something compared to 600. So let's search uh, 600 decimal and see what happens. So fortunately for us, we only get a, a handful or so, a couple handfuls, I guess, uh, of results, which is always great when we're trying to narrow down something very specific. And I'll save you the time of going through all these compares. It's this one right here that struck my eye because if we go to this address in our debugger, for example. All right, so I reloaded and let's take a look here. I've also set up the dump window to watch this address here. Here's my breakpoint on that condition, the comparison. There goes the break. So at this address, we're comparing to 258. My current value is 2DA, which is 730. That is uh, my current park rating, not to brag. And right after this comparison, we move another value at this address into EAX. Let's see what that is. That is 29E in the lower part of EAX. 29E is 670, which we'll see right here, is my number of guests. So this is indeed the condition which checks against this address, which is uh, FA, which is our goal of 250 guests, at least 250 guests. 
So this is indeed our comparison to check for a win condition. Now, if these two checks succeed, we're gonna follow this track right here, and you'll see that reflected in the debugger. The next thing that happens is we jump to, let me move over here, 411C8B, which is this guy right here. So at this point, I had to do a little bit of brute forcing to figure out exactly what part of this function triggered the clapping animation, because this function actually sets off the whole chain reaction uh, of triggering not only the clapping animation, let me go ahead and get uh, the thing rolling. It also pops up this guy right here, which I didn't necessarily want to happen every time an explosion happened. I really just wanted the applause you saw right there. So I'll talk about um, how I kind of brute force that when we get to the, uh, a little further actually, I will, we'll talk about it because it, it took place once I got a better idea of how to write some shell code to manipulate the gameplay. Before now, I'll uh, spoil it for you and just let you know that it's this function right here at 438B96 that triggers the applause animation. And it does it in a really kind of roundabout way by setting different values in a, in a series of structures that are stored in the game state. I am not going to claim that I fully understand what those structures uh, how, what they're made up of and, and how they're tracked in the game, but it seems to me that those are some kind of measure of the game state. And this particular value of 1a and hex being set in the struct seems to kick off that chain reaction um, to load that animation offset into all the different guests there. Um, again, all of that was after hours of going through different paths here and seeing um, you know, what the different struct changes did but you can also brute force it like I did by just calling the different functions here and checking to see which ones triggered just the clapping animation, which is what ended up being the easier way. I did it basically the hard way and the easy way. This is definitely the easier way of brute forcing it. Also, as an aside, now that you know where these checks are for the win condition, you could totally make your own game mod to like manipulate the game winning conditions, just throwing that out there. Uh, but that's another time, another place. So now we got kind of the two biggest rocks out of the way. We know where the animation for the applause is happening and how to trigger it. We know where the animation for the explosion is happening and how to trigger it and how to manipulate it. We have two big pieces of the puzzle, but as I was making my way through my win condition playthrough of the game, I had another demented idea. And it came to me after looking at this haunted house. Those of you who play RCT will remember that most rides, maybe all of them, I can't remember if it's all of them or just some. If you go to the customer information here, you can choose some music to play with each ride. So the, for the Haunted House, for example, it defaults to the horror style, which sounds something like, well, first of all, let me disable this super loud. Oh, it's already disabled. Yeah, the, the merry-go-round music. Sounds something like this. There we go. It took a little bit before you could hear it among the, the ambient noise, but that's the horror music that plays. So I thought it'd be funny or cool. Probably not cool. You can't really call any of this uh, stuff cool, I guess. But I thought it'd be interesting to have the horror music also play when the explosion happens and the people clap. Um, I thought that was another demented twist we could add to this horror mod of sorts. And so even though it created more work for myself, I wanted to learn more about how that whole sound system worked and I went right back to the disassembler. I'll go back to Ghidra for this one because I think we're done with all the jump table information actually. So just like we did at the beginning with stretch DI bits and looking through these different imports to see um, you know, which libraries interacted with sound, there's two at play here. So you have dsound.dll, but the game actually uses, and I'll show you how to check this, the winmm or multimedia uh, DLL library. And specifically, it uses this function right here. And the way I discovered that is by looking through the winmm.dll notes and the documentation for these functions. And I made an incredible discovery. And that was, if we go back to the MCI send string, the way this library works is it, it works instead of passing, um, you know, a series of parameters to a function you pass slightly shorter list of parameters, but 
most of the commands to actually load a sound file and play a sound file take the form of a string, a simple null terminated string. Um, and that's how the game plays and loads sound files. You can actually see this. We go back to Geeter here. And let's go ahead and look at an example of this um, being used. You see one call to MCI send string with this string, which says close all. Another example using this one, open with a placeholder for a string, type sequencer, alias music, play music from zero, stop music, play music. You can see all these strings about playing these different sounds. So where do these sounds come from and how exactly do these commands work? Well, thanks again to the heroes of the Roller Coaster Tycoon Technical Information Depot. As I was reading through these pages, I discovered that the CSS file, oops, not that one, but the CSS1, I should say, dot dot files, contain the sound effects used in the game. And you can find these in uh, the program files for the game. So I basically took all of the CSS files from the program files folder where Roller Coaster Tycoon is installed, and I just added a dot wave extension to all of them with a quick bash command. And with that, you can play them just like any other wave file. If you look at them in a hex editor, they are just regular wave files with a different extension on them. They have the wave header and everything. So for example, here's the first one, CSS3. Nice, very techno. I wanted something creepy though, and I settled between, uh, it was a close race between CSS26, which is this guy, kind of cartoony horror, but I really liked CSS25. That because I thought that was a really nice, unsettling kind of horror sound to play. Uh, you know, in this imaginary world where people are actually using this horror mod, the, you know, explosion happens, uh, the skull pops up, they don't expect it, all the NPCs turn up and clap and face the player, and then this plays. Like, how much more creepy can you get if they're not, especially if they're not expecting it? Anyway, that's in my demented imaginary world, neither here nor there. But the point is that we could easily identify um, which one we wanted to use. And the cool thing about the MCI send string function and the commands you can use with it is you really just need two strings to open a file and play it. And to open it, it looks something like this. So this is using the CSS25.dat. You want to specify the type of file, so it's wave audio. And then I added an alias here because in my next command, I can shorten it to the alias play alias to 15,000. This is another cool feature of the MCI send string uh, command for play is you can set a region to play of the sound. So if you want to play from, you know, 1,000 to 2,000, which I think that's in milliseconds, basically the string I use here plays the first 15 or so. Uh, seconds of the sound file. Now, you can actually condense this down to one play command, I think. I tested it where you could send in a, you could basically do something like this, but I found that this really slowed down the loading and it caused some weird audio glitches when I tried that. So I did what the game does. Uh, if we go back to here, it opens it and then it plays. Uh, that's what I ended up doing in the mod is I open the file first, kind of prime it, give it an alias, and then play it for the first 15 seconds at least every time we trigger that explosion plus applause effect. So, wow, we now have all the pieces to make this vision come to life, but what we're missing is the glue. How do we put all of this together with the explosion, triggering the applause effect, triggering the music and baking it into the game in a way that we don't break anything else going on in the game. I discovered the answer of how the hell I was going to glue all this together by taking a second look at that section of the code that loads the explosion animation. We looked at it in Ida earlier, now I'm looking at it in Ghidra. I knew that this part of the code was going to be the spark that caused the chain reaction of all the other stuff I wanted to happen. I wanted the explosion to happen, I wanted the graphics of the explosion to be swapped out, and then I wanted the sound to play, and then I wanted that applause to happen, and all of it happened as soon as the explosion took place. 
I made this serendipitous discovery, I still can't believe this lined up as well as it did, that looking at this call that takes place right after uh, we set up for the explosion to happen, this is the call that kind of uh, takes care of running the explosion animation. The opcode for this instruction here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytes. Why is that relevant or important at all? Well, as it turns out, if you go to, uh, I like to use diffuse here. This is an online uh, x86 assembler and disassembler. If we do an instruction like a move an address into EAX and then call that address, the opcodes for that end up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytes. What that means for us is we can replace this call with a call to some other region in memory that has our shell code for the mod that'll take care of doing all the other things we need to do. And then we can come back and call this function, restore the stack to what it was before we did our shell code, and the gameplay will continue. And by using a part of the code that has exactly seven bytes, we can ensure that we don't overwrite anything and that all the gameplay continues exactly as expected. Now, the only challenge left to solve is where do we put our shell code? Well, once again, serendipitously, if we scroll all the way down to the bottom sections of the executable, sorry, I went too far. I should say not to the very bottom of the executable, but right before the TDB section, in the resource section here, there's some bytes here that go one, two, three, four, three, two, one, and then zero, followed by a bunch of negative space that's not referenced anywhere else in the program. What does that mean? Well, as a reverser and as a modder, that is heaven on earth because we can write whatever we want to these null bytes and not have to worry about impacting the gameplay. So this region right here particularly is gonna be the perfect spot to put some shell code for doing everything we want to do. And again, I'll talk more about uh, the Python code to automate this, but I'll show you the shell code that I ended up settling on by swapping over to the patch version I have open in Ghidra over here. So if we go to that same region in the patch version, you'll see that it's now filled with not null bytes, but other bytes here. And there's a cross-reference that Gator's picked up back to where our explosion animation is triggered. Now you'll notice this has also changed from, if I go back over here, FA75, which was our explosion animation offset, to B94A, which was our skull offset. So I changed that. And then I did what I talked about earlier and I replaced, let me try to see if I can do a good side-by-side -side here. Pull this over a little bit. Uh, it's going to be iffy, but we'll make it work. I replaced this call of seven bytes with a move the pointer to C412, C2. That's for that region in the code where those null bytes were into EAX and then call that function. Now, if we go to that region, Ghidra doesn't recognize that this is code. So what we're going to do is highlight the stuff right here, it did pick up that I put two strings here as well. And you'll recognize these as the commands we need to send to MCI send string. So you can either right click and choose disassemble or simply press a D on the keyboard and Ghidra will start to recognize this as code. So this is the shell code that we put into place. So when we make that call up here, this is what's going to run. So the first thing that happens actually is we go ahead and put in the same command that was there in the original version, just so we can keep the gameplay running. The next thing I do here is do a push AD instruction, which is gonna copy all the current register values down to the stack, uh, push them onto the stack so we can preserve what the stack looked like. Because when we run the rest of our shell code and run these functions, we might make changes to the registers that might mess up the gameplay uh, once we return from our shell code. So I want to preserve those values by pushing them on the stack. The next portion is a call to MCI send string, which if we go back to that page, you'll see it's got uh, four parameters here. And the only one we really care about is the first one, which is the string to send. And that is our open. Uh, you can't see all of it here. Maybe if I scroll down, and I'm not going to bother with trying to expand that. 
but it's that uh, command I showed earlier. I don't think I still have it up of the opening, the CSS 25.dat file. Oh, there you go. If I hover over it, you can see it. Open that file, type wave audio alias horror. And you'll notice that we've included some wrapping quotes, escape quotes around there and uh, double slashes so that it can find the right path there. And then the second string is the play that aliased soundtrack to the 15,000 mark, which is about 15 seconds. So back up to our shell code, we send that to MCI send string first, the open command. Then we send the play command, and then we move function 438B96, which again is that function that triggers the actual um, applause animation. We move that into EAX, we call that function before we pop AD, which basically reverses what we did here. It moves all those registers we saved to the stack back into the registers, and then we return right back to where the explosion animation concludes, and we return right back to gameplay. And again, I'll show you how to automate that in a little bit, but that is the shell code that makes up our mod. And it's insane, right? This, this is not a whole lot of shell code to figure out, but it took all of that effort to discover how the explosion worked, how the wind condition and animation worked, how the graphics were set just to put together this tiny little demented mod. So with all of that in mind, let's go ahead and run the patched program and let's see if we were successful in creating a Jordan Peele horror version of Roller Coaster Tycoon. I'm gonna go ahead and go to my patched executable here and let's go ahead and run the game. Oops, I actually already have it running. So let's go ahead and close that and try again. And if all goes well, we should get that demented scene to work, but the gameplay should go on without any other uh, weird things happening or unexpected or undesired things happening even. So I'm gonna go lo load my Skelly test, which was taken right before a crash. And we'll see if in the patch version, this triggers the reaction we wanted it to. And there it is. Oh, I cannot tell you, I'm reliving it right now. The satisfaction that I had when <laughs> months of work came together and that actually worked. Uh, just for that little five second period, I'm gonna do it again. So one more time, let's follow this as we work through the shell code. So we know that the animation has been replaced. The uh, call has been replaced and we're gonna call down here run the animation. We're going to open the sound file first and then play it. I did that first before the applause because it takes a little bit of time for that to process and then the applause will happen. So one more time, crash takes place, skelly happens, the applause animation runs and you can barely hear it probably in the background but the track has started playing and it only plays for the first 15 seconds because I thought it'd be annoying if it just played the whole however many minute, minute track uh, every time this happened. But yeah, there it is. And again, you know, this was just to bring a demented fever dream to life. But you can manipulate this knowing what you know now after this tutorial. You could manipulate this to do whatever you want. You could probably look through the code and find other animation triggers that you could overwrite. Um, as I've said in my previous videos, the point of these videos is not to put out a mod really that people are going to use. The point is to teach you the skills to find these things and not only these older games, but these modern games as well. Um, and the kind of things to look out for and the kind of thought processes that go into reversing and patching games and making sure that when you do make a mod, you're not negatively impacting other parts of the game. So with that said, the next part is to go through and show you the code that automates all of this. It's also, of course, in the GitHub repo that I'll link in the description. But for those of you who may not wanna stick around for that, um, if you take nothing else away from this video, aside from what I just said about kind of the thought process behind reversing, um, know that the very important valuable lesson I learned through this is if you're going into something and 
you're having a tough time with it, you're running against the wall, uh, you're banging your head against the wall, sometimes it really does, and I know it's cliche, it really does help to step away. And if that thing keeps, you know, scratching at your brain, bringing you back to it, sometimes it's worth sticking at it. Uh, this one was definitely worth persisting in. Uh, the satisfaction I got from the final mod actually working exactly, yeah, actually not even exactly, even better than the original vision I had uh, was unrivaled. It, it's an incredible feeling, and I learned so, so much uh, in the process of this. Now, I could have given up earlier, and I still would have learned as much. Sometimes you do have to give up if you're just sinking time into something that's taking your energy away from something else more important in your life. Yeah, totally understandable. But for those things that you're able to persist with, like, for example, learning reversing or learning game hacking or whatever you're pursuing, it is really worth it if you just keep with it and you know, speaking from experience, even doing a few minutes a day uh, of that thing will make you feel so much better uh, in keeping after it. Anyway, I'll get off my box now. For those of you who just wanted to see the background of the mod, uh, you can leave us here. But for those of you who are interested in the technical details of the script, and I'll also be speaking to um, a little bit more that I learned about the black box problem we saw in the first RCT video, Stick around because we're going to be talking about that next.